To tyle z kwestii organizacyjnych. Teraz część, taka wstęp, przedstawianie nas, organizatorów i organizacji, która dzisiaj jest naszym gościem w postaci Ewgenii. O samym Centrum Edukacji Obywatelskiej. Jesteśmy organizacją pozarządową, która pracuje z nauczycielami, nauczycielkami, dyrektorami, dyrektorkami. Pracujemy z prawie 10 tysiącami szkół i działamy na rzecz wspierania nauczycieli, nauczycielek w tym, żeby Państwa praca była znowuż bardziej wspierająca dla uczniów i uczennic, żeby pomagać im się angażować w ich naukę, żeby ten proces edukacji też pomagał im w odpowiadaniu na te wyzwania współczesnego świata, żeby uczniowie i uczennice mieli szansę rozwijać swoje zainteresowania, umiejętność krytycznego myślenia, otwartość, umiejętność współpracy i Jednym z takich działań na rzecz tego jest program Wychowanie to podstawa, w ramach którego się dzisiaj spotykamy. Tutaj jeszcze zaproszenie do naszych stron internetowych, jest strona internetowa CO, blog edukacyjny, jak i też strona na Facebooku, serdecznie tam Państwa zapraszamy. No i o samym projekcie Wychowanie to podstawa, w ramach którego się dzisiaj spotykamy. Program składa się z takich dwóch ścieżek, indywidualnej i szkolnej. I to nasze dzisiejsze spotkanie jest częścią tej ścieżki indywidualnej, w ramach której powstały narzędziowniki, z których nauczyciele, nauczycielki mogą korzystać, gdzie znajdą dużo materiałów praktycznych dla wychowawców i wychowawczyń klas, bo sam program jest właśnie skierowany dla wychowawców i wychowawczyń jaki odbywał się i dziś jest ostatnie spotkanie z tego cyklu, cykl webinariów eksperckich. Trwa również kurs internetowy i to są takie działania, w których nauczyciele, nauczycielki mogli brać udział indywidualnie, a niedługo zacznie się też taka część ścieżka szkolna, w której już biorą udział całe szkoły, i w ramach tego będą się odbywały warsztaty, szkoła będzie objęta taką opieką merytoryczną, diagnozowane też będą potrzeby i opracowywany program profilaktyczno-wychowawczy. I naszym partnerem w projekcie Wychowanie to podstawa jest organizacja Human Rights Academy, które dzisiaj reprezentuje Jewgenia a sam projekt ma szansę się odbywać dzięki dofinansowaniu, które otrzymaliśmy od Islandii, Liechtensteinu i Norwegii w funduszy EOG. I może teraz jeszcze chciałabym Państwu opowiedzieć troszeczkę o Jewgenii Korolcewej, która zaraz Państwu przybliży edukację włączającą na przykładzie Norwegii. I chcemy dzisiaj z Państwem porozmawiać o tym, jak edukacja włączająca może realizować prawa człowieka, ponieważ specjalizacją Jewgeni i organizacji, którą reprezentuje, są właśnie prawa człowieka. Dzisiaj z takiej perspektywy chcielibyśmy się przyjrzeć tym naszym zagadnieniom, pomyśleć trochę o tym, z jednej strony, jak edukacja włączająca, w które z tych praw człowieka ona realizuje i gdzie jakby te idee się spotykają, a także Jewginia pokaże kilka takich przykładów też z prawa o edukacji w Norwegii, które znowuż jest tak kształtowane, żeby tę edukację włączającą wspierać. I może już tyle z tych wstępów. Oddaję głos Jewgenii i jeszcze raz przypominam, jeżeli by Państwo chcieli usłyszeć to tłumaczenie na język polski, trzeba sobie wybrać tłumaczenie na język portugalski. Okej, okay, thank you Elżbieta and uh, hi everybody. 
so many people. I cannot see all the faces, but uh, I see there are a lot of people coming together this evening. Nice to greet you from Oslo, from Norway, and from Human Rights Academy. Well, I was supposed to to share a presentation, but... Okay, then I can share it. Okay, it's bit, uh, um, yeah, if it's okay for you, because otherwise I can only show my, my version, but... Yeah, okay. Give us Polish version. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry for my voice, I don't understand what's going on, but I will try to, to do my best. Um, well, yes, uh, Human Rights Academy is an uh, NGO, so, and we are quite practical NGO here in Oslo, uh, working for the last um, 15 years, almost, uh, with uh, teachers, actually, mainly with teachers in civics and history in English, um, but also in, with uh, pedagogy, um, teacher students in different countries, that's the kind of touched groups we are. Uh, like to work with and uh, I do hope some of you have a teacher background and uh, yeah feel free to ask questions um, uh, as far as we are going because um, as I said we, we work a lot of practical with dialogue and interaction and not that lecturing that much. Uh, I'll try to follow up the chat for questions uh, so feel free to put down it's there in Polish, it's fine, I think, because we have uh, cute interpreters with us tonight. Um, well, yes, since I'm the representative of civil society here in Norway, uh, working on human rights education and uh, democratic citizenship, I will all the time go back to the role of civil society and civil society institutions as such, uh, and what kind of role, what kind of function we might have when we are talking about school, school education and um, democracy in school and beyond the school. Can you go? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, yes, I was supposed to show you the, um, this uh, <clears throat> short video just to give you an idea of what the education is about. Uh, but maybe I just uh, tell it shortly and then you will be able to see yourself. <laughs> it's in Norwegian even though. so. Um, this video will say out in very short, uh, will give us very short information uh, focusing on that nine of 10 kids who are going to kindergarten. And that's an interesting fact because the kindergarten is, um, uh, the kindergarten is a uh, harmonic part of educational system. So actually democracy and democracy learning is starting with the kindergarten. Um, Elisbeta, I think we have a message from um, a participant, something about um, interpretation. Yes. It's not it's yeah. Don't hear interpretation. That the, um, uh, the interpretation is not loud enough, I guess. Uh, okay. But our uh, interpreters are uh, giving some guidelines. <laughs> okay, maybe then I speak slowly. Uh, another interesting fact about uh, uh, school education here uh, is that one of uh, the fifth kid, like every fifth kid here in Norway has a minority background. Most probably by minority background would mean that uh, a kid would have belonging uh, relation to some other cultural backgrounds than, for example, like Norwegian, the so-called Norwegian background. Um, <clears throat> The third effect is that 40% uh, of teachers here in Norway are qualified. This is also quite a cute fact because um, there is all the time a discussion whether our teachers working in schools are qualified enough to give a good education. Let, this is a very um, vital discussion. We do also have a lot of uh, um, teachers in primary schools. It's like 3,000 teachers more uh, during the last five years. And uh, thanks to this, uh, it's quite common, at least here in Oslo, which is quite, uh, uh, quite a big city, to have two teachers in a class. So not only one teacher, but two teachers, uh, so that uh, per one teacher you have a load of uh, 15, 17 kids to take responsibility for. 
We do also have uh, special needs, the so-called special needs education. Uh, and we see that uh, people will get special needs education as, uh, as uh, more adult they will be. Uh, yes, and the last fact, which is quite enjoyable, uh, is uh, statistics show me that nine of 10 pupils would enjoy to go to school here in Norway. So they would not prefer to stay at home or just to uh, drop, uh, but uh, yeah. And we see that it's less bullying as kids getting older. All these topics in a way, uh, all these factors in a way, I will be coming back in my speech, but just to give an idea shortly what the school uh, education system in Norway is. <coughs> And to start with, uh, to start with, I, I would like uh, to mention for you um, our new law on education. It's quite a cute fact also because uh, you know uh, Norway as a state has had state church for quite a lot of time, like 200 years, and uh, it took some time to separate state church, church power from school education as such. It, has happened in back in 2007 after a group of parents has delivered uh, a case in the Strasbourg court of the European Court of Human Rights uh, protesting of religion education in Norwegian schools. So at the time being we did not have any pure religion education, you know, Christian uh, education as such, uh, but we do have, uh, it's been called ethics and religious uh, multiculturality and all this stuff. But for the first time ever, uh, back in uh, 2017, human rights uh, and human dignity as a value has been put down into the law of uh, education. So this introduction to the law, which, is, which you might read here in Polish language, is um, a kind of guidelines what the education is to be about here in Norway, and it's precising uh, in my way, quite good. Um, what teachers should care about, what parents uh, uh, can know, like what kind of education their kids would get. So it's still precise in that we are, we are just human, human beings and we do make mistakes and that's fine. <laughs> that's normal. That's how we learn. But it's new. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, while we are talking about uh, school education as such, we should always uh, go back to some legislation. And I mean, uh, of course, international legislation would be very crucial here, as to Norway, as to Poland, as to any other European country. Uh, also, because we are members of the Council of Europe, at this uh, presentation, um, I use the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is probably the only international document uh, the countries, our countries and our state governments have uh, ratified. So I do want to ask you, and here's the interactive part is coming in. I do want to ask you uh, as to what kind of rights uh, you would think about if you think about, if you think about school education and your own kid, your own pupil, for example. What would come to your mind? If you can put it down in chat, that's fine. If not, you can make a microphone, take a microphone and have a speech shortly. Tak, tutaj zachęcamy do użycia czatu, ponieważ jeszcze nie jest um, uwolniona ta funkcja, żeby mogli Państwo wziąć ah, mikrofony. Oh, więc na razie... Yes, there is, a, there is an answer, I think it's prawo do nauki. Um, is it right to education, right? Or right to science in a way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right to education. Uh, yes, uh, anything also, else? Uh, you can also switch to the translation into English, if you like. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's true. Okay, mm 
-hmm. the right to assessment something yes exactly prawo do swobody wypowiadania prawo do szacunku mm. akceptacji perfect right to freedom, uh, freedom of speech right to be respected right to be assessed in a decent way well that's fine yes that's exactly what i want to direct our discussion further um if you can go down um to be quite precisely and uh, having a united convention on the rights of the child in particular uh we would definitely uh, okay we will skip the article 28 which is saying that our kids have to go to school and as parents have to send our kids to school and the primary school is to be free of charge but the article 29 is going further and gives us some guidelines as to what kind of education the kids are supposed to get and in this sense we are talking about the education which would contribute to the development of child to to his or her full potential right so it's you have a kind of the state the government is supposed to make up the conditions so such conditions that every child can develop uh, their own personality in a good way and bring all the potentials they have inside of you yourself and the last um, um almost last point d which is highlighted in polish language is saying about that it's the education is also about uh, being being able to live in a free society society uh, which is compliant of many different uh, persons with different backgrounds so it's also it's, it's about inclusion but it's also about discrimination non discriminations uh, and state our governments our authorities have to be uh, aware of that i think the, this this right to the so called college education is very crucial because it's very concrete it's not an abstract it's very concrete guidelines for how you make up an education system in any country also norway thank you and in norway we do have uh, we are lucky guys so we have our own ed uh, education as probably you also in poland i'm pretty much sure so in the same law of education which i was referring initially uh, we do have um, an additional right, which we call uh, which we call a right to safe school environment, and this word safety is um, in some ways it's new. On the other uh, side, it's not new because it's not only safe space. I mean, it's not uh, the kid is not supposed to fall down and get a damage and get a plaster and all this stuff. It's also about psychological comfort. It's also about psychological uh, safety and security, the feeling of safety uh, as far as kids being sent to school. And that's probably um, why we do have questionnaires running every year uh, where kids can evaluate their own schools and they can evaluate their own education and also parents can do this. So you actually can have a, um, give a very huge feedback, how it's going on. Um, the Norwegian legislation is also uh, opening up, uh, thank you, is also opening up for quite a dialogue between parents as a group and uh, kids themselves. So school administration and parents, uh, it's very common to work together. It's very common to have a discussion and it's quite common to be to listen to what parents have to say in a way this is important this is also like law is saying but it's also in practice is being practiced a lot uh, i used to i use this uh, text in polish uh, because it's um, from save children it's an ngo here in norway it's quite big uh, they do have uh, brochures in different languages so they had one in polish it was very good and here again it's being delivered in any schools it's being uh, spread out to all different parents with different backgrounds language backgrounds as well and still precising uh, like step by step what you have to be cautious about what uh, 
uh, what you have to uh, be attentive at. I mean, okay, you send your kid, but if your kid's studying, uh, starting, uh, ask you, please, I don't want to go to school, there is something, I, without explaining even a reason, uh, this would be enough sign uh, to, well, not to alarm, but uh, this will be enough actually to stop down and take contact with school and school uh, administration has to react. Like school administration, they don't have the right to say, yeah, yeah, maybe he, has, he had a bad day, maybe, um, I don't know, he didn't sleep that well, maybe he is ill. So they have to take it seriously. Uh, and this is very strict because um, for maybe last 20 years, we do have quite ugly cases of kids who, hasn't, who haven't been taken seriously. So this is kind of conclusion from practical, how does it, uh, from the real life that uh, you, we used to say that it's better to take an action, it's better to take a step one more time more than not to take it at all. It's because of kids and their rights. So it's very strict with this. Another right, um, which is crucial, uh, crucial again, and uh, which has been mentioned in the uh, United Nations uh, Convention on the Right of the Child, uh, is, um, is in a way uh, in relation to your answer about the freedom of speech because uh, kids do have the right, <laughs> they do have freedom of speech. They do, they should have the right to speak up their minds. Of course, uh, it will depend on how mature they are, uh, what the, their age is, but believe me, um, from kindergarten level even, uh, this is also quite crucial and it's very common to make, uh, to listen to kids. They can decide uh, well, uh, six years old, five years old can decide about the colors of the bench in their kindergarten and uh, 12 years old uh, kids can decide whether they would attend um, any New Year celebration, for example, or any um, church, um, different church. It doesn't have to be Christian, even it can be Muslim, it can be Jewish, it can be Buddhist. So when it comes to their freedom of consciousness, freedom of religion, it goes together with the freedom of speech and uh, freedom to decide about their own life, about their own situation. This is also quite crucial. Uh, and the basic, of course, uh, the basic for like the fundament for any rights uh, we have to keep in mind would be uh, the principle of non-discrimination. The principle of non-discrimination is uh, it's about children's rights, it's about women's rights, it's about human rights, because both kids and women and um, some gr other groups, minority groups, they still are human beings. So st state uh, authorities and state policies, they don't, they're not supposed to differentiate between different people. In our case, in uh, the educational um, space, it would mean that uh, our authorities have to provide equal access to education. It would, in Norway, in Norway it's also, of course, very uh, relevant. It would mean, um, for example, it would mean uh, discussion and practices uh, of uh, the so-called vulnerable groups of children, like children coming from poor families, like poor families, uh, so there are some measures being taken to how to include, not on, only to include, but how to uh, make these kids not to feel that they're coming from poor families, for example. But also kids with their physical disabilities, of course, and kids from, uh, with minority backgrounds, with uh, language backgrounds or maybe cultural backgrounds. But also kids are being uh, detained. Uh, there are not many kids being detained here in Norway. There are no um, prisons for children, for example, but you do have um, children's social services and you do, we do have refugee camps. Uh, there are still kids there. 
they are under 18 years old and uh, they, they are not supposed to be discriminated. They are supposed to have access to education on the equal level. Um, if you don't have any questions so far, we just continue, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then I would, uh, of course, um, bring to your attention straight away the efforts uh, which are being done by the civil society here in Norway. And uh, the first, which comes to my mind, of course, uh, is uh, the uh, Student Council of Norway, because it's cute organization, it's very young, they are school children themselves, they are quite, uh, uh, they're quite democratic because they elect and re-elect themselves every year. So it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of re running all to, uh, together. It's not a bureaucratic uh, structure in a way. They are, um, uh, they are high, sc high school students, so they would be like uh, 17, 18, 19 years old. Uh, after a while, because they have been existing for 40 years as minimum, after a while they have become quite a big, uh, strong political voice. Uh, because the idea is, hey, look, uh, you, you, you speak up so much about school, you have so many different ideas about school, um, but we kids, we pupils ourselves know how school is to be because we go there every day and we see teachers every day and we, uh, we see the books we are reading, we see the electronic gadgets we are using, uh, we see the exams, they are poor, we don't, we are getting stressed, for example, they would say. So they're trying to push uh, the discussion what their modern vision school is about further and further. Another uh, important thing what they would do, uh, they would provide legal aid to pupils. So any kid uh, here in Norway can anonymously contact the Student Council of Norway uh, by email or by some other, just giving a phone and uh, tell his or her own story. It can be about discrimination, it can be about bullying, it can be about um, non-safe uh, environment, for example. It can be um, about poor light, <laughs> even, about uh, heating, ventilation, many different uh, stuff. But uh, legal aid they, they are providing is really uh, make it, makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference because uh, mostly all, the, all uh, the recreational space in the schools in Norway would, would look like this. You have you have seen the picture. Uh, it's not because school administration is so cute and uh, it's not because uh, national uh, authorities are so kind, but it's also because, for example, the student council is pushing and saying, uh, we are sitting too much, our people are sitting too much, they are too much passive. We have so many electronic, for example, uh, supplies today in schools. So the motivation to go around and to climb, uh, to run, to jump is getting lower and lower. So uh, today, uh, when you come to school, outdoor activities would be a very huge part of school life, actually. Uh, this is not a typical school, uh, but <laughs> it's, it's uh, it's not untypical also, it's high schools. This picture that you see now, it's high school. Uh, we use, as a Human Rights Academy, we used to cooperate with this school, of Cuban school, quite a lot. And uh, it's basically a very old factory building, which is renovated in a school now. And the main idea would be you have to have space. You have to, to have space, you have to have your own, um, you have to have your own space to lay down if you want, to sit and read. Uh, to have a lunch, to have a sofa, uh, so to have a place you want to come to, to study. That's like the main idea. The classroom would also be like, like this, more or less. Uh, it would mean that you don't have furniture uh, like stable on the floor. You can move, of course, you can move, you can, uh, again, sitting on the floor, running around from corner to corner. I've been many times in schools here and uh, looking at the teachers, they are running with students, uh, like marathon. So it's a lot of space and you are using the space quite actively in your work. Um, 
be the teacher. I would also uh, show you this picture. It, it, it's basically it's a, a screenshot from um, primary school, uh, primary and secondary school, uh, quite a big school. But my idea, my idea was uh, to show you here that um, I'm sorry, it's Norwegian, but uh, schools are different. I mean, they are the, the same because they are in Norway, but they are also different because every school would have some focus some specific focus. In this matter, uh, these primary schools would have uh, a focus on the so-called dream school, drömmeskolen. Dream school, it's about um, civil society organizations coming into school and providing uh, exercises, providing activities, project ideas when it comes to social communications between kids when it comes to the use of language, what kind of words they are using, how they describe each other, how they are talking to each other, uh, what's going on on social media, when they go home, uh, this stuff. So, it's, so my idea was to show you here that the focus area can be very different from school to school, but it's very common. And it's very, um, it's very usual to send the kids to the neighboring school. I mean, it's uh, not that usual to bring your child far away on the other uh, part of the city. And it's, this is also a part of right to education, right? Because um, again, authorities trying to make up conditions so that the people are uh, uh, comfort with and uh, would think that, okay, I will send my kids to this school, neighboring to my house no problem, there is not that big difference between the schools. Well, yes, and uh, coming back to, um, coming back to my initial um, sentence about the teacher competencies. I mean, I, I told you 40% of teachers in Norway are qualified teachers. It would mean that we still are, um, have some work to do. But we do have teachers and they are quite good uh, in my personal appearance, uh, uh, opinion because we have been into school as an NGO several times. But um, when I ask you, when it comes to competences teachers should have in order to provide quality education, what would you bring out? What would you... Um, what would you appreciate put on the first place? If you can put in the chat, that would be cute. Just wait, I forgot to, to put English. Um, uh, I think I understand empathia, mm -hmm. like empathy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Empathy, yes, in its attitude to the children. Creativity, empathy. I don't hear English, so I don't know. So uh, creativity, understanding, empathy, mm -hmm. um, openness. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard it now. Other, yeah, you can hear it, okay. Mm -hmm. Communication, okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Well, yes, yeah, so that was also, um, I was thinking about uh, basically, uh, especially, um, well, empathy, yes, because I mean, being a teacher, it would be uh, very strange to be uh, strict or, I don't know, very strict or very rigid, and not that flexible, but I like the answer open to change <laughs> and um, <clears throat> embrace diversity. When it comes to open to change, mm, creativity, yes, exactly. Because, you know, and that's because you are, 
um, you are mentioning these uh, characteristics because when it comes to teacher education, uh, it's, it's good, but it's also some, some, sometimes, somehow, it's not up to the date. I mean, when you come to school, <laughs> it's crucial for a teacher to be open for new ideas, for new uh, suggestions, for new methods also. I used to quote, you know, uh, we do have a, um, a practical exercise called dialogue exercise, uh, which we are doing quite a lot uh, in, in schools also, they are using it quite a lot, I see. They would put kids into three groups, like agree, don't agree, doubt, I don't know, right? And I give you a sentence, you have to make a position, uh, whether you agree, you go there, don't agree, and then you argue with each other, hear to each other's um, arguments, and you can change uh, your position. And believe me, when we are working with teachers, uh, it's uh, quite often they would not change the position. They would think, no, but I was, I'm sure it's like this. I'm because I have experience and this and this and this. So it's for them, it's very uh, sometimes uh, difficult to, to change positions. But youngsters, uh, 16, 15 years old, they would go in the room all the time, back and forth, back and forth. So to be open, yes, absolutely. I embrace your idea. Diversity, yes, that's crucial. That is basic uh, idea about human rights actually that we are not living anymore in a homogeneous society just with just one culture with just one language with just um yeah not defining uh, groups or based on abilities or possibilities and different backgrounds so diversity absolutely mm -hmm. uh, what i would uh, also but I would also bring um, to our discussion uh, would be um, um, in relation to the right to get a quality of education, children's right. You have also the right <laughs> of a teacher, of a professional, to have a freedom of um, uh, not only thought, but to have your academic freedom. It would mean you choose yourself what kind of sources you are using when you are teaching. You choose yourself what kind of methods you are using and what kind of content you are using when you are teaching. Of course, we, can, we have no uh, possibility to go into um, particular subjects right now. I would definitely uh, talk only about civics, for example. When you teach civics, when you teach topics like human rights, like democracy, like rule of law, like freedom of speech, like uh, civil society, like um, prohibition of torture, in these uh, topics, the teacher is quite free to choose when it comes to content, but it also when it comes to uh, methods. And I would uh, <clears throat> stick to your idea open to change and advocate that um, when we are talking about participation of civil society in uh, uh, school life, it's also up to teachers be not only open, but to um, embrace the kind of idea that we are supposed to teach our kids about real life. Not about any, um, uh, how you call this, not about any dream, about utopia, for example. Because pupils, our pupils and our kids, they do have a lot of experience from real life. They're coming from families they're coming, uh, they see their parents earning this and that, losing jobs, finding new jobs, having problems. Uh, they see other family relations. They go to activities. They uh, read the children's newspapers here. Uh, we also have news for children about what's going on in the world, about like, I don't know, Islamic State, about Syria about uh, Corona. I mean, they are not on their own planet, right? They are a part of our real life. And uh, sometimes for teachers, it can be difficult <laughs> to answer all the questions, but it doesn't have to be that you close your up and say, no, 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 also on this we don't talk, this you are, you are not that mature. Um, yeah, you have to grow up, things like this. The, um, 
they are not happening. <laughs> They're happening less and less as I see it. Um, but in order to make it more uh, comfortable for a kid, if you want, to make it more relaxed, I would advocate for some um, interactive methods of teaching, which we're also trying to give uh, for some teachers uh, when we are cooperating with schools here in Norway. Uh, let me just uh, show you very quickly uh, uh, pictures, just uh, demonstrating what it could be. Uh, this is, would be, um, this is the so-called newspaper exercise. So basically you work with the newspapers in your own country and to trying to, to, to challenge the kids to reflect, not reading, not, not working with the text, but only reflect on photos, on illustrations, when it, and try to define the situation with human rights, whatever human rights, they don't have to, to give you correct answers, is good or bad or something in between, something is happening. And then uh, you just divide kids into groups and they would um, summarize and present what do they have been, uh, um, what do they have done in groups. So that's a, an okay also starting point to work on the topics of human rights, for example, if you want, or democracy. And, um, and also in order to show that human rights are not about abstract con concepts. It's not, not only for United Nations, it's not only for politicians and lawyers. It's the part of our, our life. It's the, when you open your newspaper, you see actually the human rights uh, every day, almost. Um, mm -hmm. Another would be, of course, group work. I'm pretty much sure you're using it also yourself in, in, in the classroom because um, in this uh, sense, in this picture, we have an exercise about the um, gender roles. It can be uh, uh, used on youngsters from 13 years old, and you challenge them to think what is an advantage of being a woman in my society, what is a disadvantage of being a woman in my society, and the same with a man, advantage, disadvantage, and then you have a, a kind of rounding up discussion uh, what is the biological sex what is the social se sex and what are what are the expectations to us being a woman being a man and uh, depending on how much time you have you can always back up with uh, some international legislation for example on women rights on the women convention of the united nations or istanbul convention Prohibiting domestic violence, for example. Mm -hmm. Just a short uh, interruption. Um, widzę, że czasami Państwo mm, podnoszą rękę i tymczasem nie mamy takiej możliwości, żeby udzielić Państwu głosu, więc prosiłabym, jeżeli e, na przykład coś się dzieje technicznego i potrzebują Państwo wsparcia, żeby też to napisać na czacie. Jeżeli pojawiają się jakieś pytania, to też można je albo zapisać na czacie, a jeżeli to jest jakieś takie pytanie, z którym można poczekać, to w ikonce Q&A i tam je zobaczymy też pod koniec spotkania. I gdyby na przykład było tak, że teraz mają Państwo na pełnym ekranie wyświetloną prezentację i nie wiedzą, gdzie znaleźć ten czat i, i Q&A, to można wyjść jakby z tego widoku pełnego, pełnoekranowego i wtedy pojawią się te wszystkie ikonki, z których można skorzystać. Więc jeżeli teraz Państwo nie wiedzą, gdzie kliknąć, to można kliknąć Escape na klawiaturze i wtedy będzie więcej tych funkcji. I tymczasem byśmy prosili o komunikację właśnie przez czat. O, coś się pojawiło. A, i tak, i jest z nami też jeszcze Emilia, która może tutaj Państwu pomagać właśnie na czacie w sprawie też tych technicznych kłopotów, jeżeli jakieś są. Um, dobrze, dziękuję. To tak, bo widziałam, że pojawiają się podniesione ręce. Evgenia, you can continue. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, thank you, Elisabetta. Yes, if you have any questions, I would love it, but uh, yeah, you find out, guys, whether we take it in chat or when we finish. Um, well, yes, um, can we go further, Elisabetta? 
Mm. Well, yeah, what is also a picture demonstrating and a method we are using quite a lot. Um, you know, if you can come back a bit, I don't know, to the girls dancing together. Uh, it's about uh, not about diversity even but, but it's about uh, intercultural communication something called we call cultural communication of course this all these pictures would be a kind of uh, illustration so what we can do in a classroom but uh, they are of course a part an integrated part of uh, uh, teaching uh, we give either on our own or together with a uh, teacher in schools here in Norway um, mm -hmm. Another would be a presentation. Okay, okay, we stop. Okay, another would be a presentation. Basically, it's been used quite a lot. Uh, I'm pretty much sure in Poland too. This picture is about another exercise we are in love with: is timelines of human rights. So you basically give um, uh, away again illustrations or pictures of events, people having played uh, a role, a crucial role, in uh, establishing of human rights as idea, but also as a legal international standard, what a decent life is for any, any person, like whatever background. Um, this is an exercise which has been used in school quite a lot, and um, it's, um, I would, I would uh, recommend highly for you if you want to try it out. Mm -hmm. uh, Yetinia, would you yeah. like to answer that question or would you rather leave sure, it no uh, to the end? Mm -hmm. Okay, then we have uh, one question from Marlena. Uh, mm -hmm. What happens when the law is not um, obeyed? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't understand. What, what happens when when uh, people maybe uh, at school, uh, maybe teachers, I don't know, uh, uh, do not obey the laws. When children don't obey the laws. Uh, uh, it's not specific, so maybe we can ask uh, Panią Marlenę, uh, czy możemy poprosić o um, doprecyzowanie, oh, when teachers do not obey the law. Marlena put something now Chile. Now mm -hmm. Chile. I don't uh, so the question is about the teachers. Oh yes, that's a good question. Uh, um, I will actually come to this uh, part at the very end of my presentation, but uh, in short, uh, well, it happens. It would depend <laughs> what kind of right it is about. But uh, if you would, uh, if you think about the bullying, for example. Not a teacher, but it's, first of all, um, in situations with bullying, um, it will be the responsibility of school administration. So, I mean, if I'm a parent and I come into my school and say, hey, look, there is something wrong with my kid. I suspect this and these things are happening. Again, school administration, rector, prorector, uh, they cannot just say, yeah, okay, just wait. Or they cannot just say, well, yes, we will look about it and uh, you don't hear uh, a thing. So we, yes, we do have um, several police uh, cases now in Norway when the school administration was too slow to react. And uh, as a result, they uh, paid compensation to the families, not schools, but communes, like local government had to pay the compensation to this or that family. Uh, a teacher would not be put in, into prison because uh, uh, because we do also have other mechanisms how to solve the problems like conflict resolutions, institutions and all this stuff I will mention at the very end. Uh, another method, uh, well yes, it's also group work basically on the freedom of speech. It's quite cute with kids when you ask, again you divide into groups and you ask uh, one group to advocate for 100% freedom of speech without any limits and to give um, a task to another group, advocate for limits of freedom of speech. And then we have this discussion. So my idea is here to uh, show you that being a teacher, you don't have to come with um, right answers straight away. 
So teachers are trying to use now what kids know, what do they know from the real life, from the family life, from, I don't know, media and from social media on this or that topic, for example, in freedom of speech, to use what their opinions are. And then at the very end, after they present it, after they debate it, after they discussed, you can give them some factual information, for example, about the European Convention on Human Rights and the freedom of speech and how it's working, how it's being limited, in what cases it can be actually limited. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We're going back to the okay. presentation. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. um, yeah, this is a pantomime. Uh, it's also very good. It's absolutely possible into the classroom. Uh, pantomime on human rights. You see this girl, she's shouting. So most probably she's, she's trying to say something and guys are um, hindering her, not trying not to allow. So the pantomime is supposed to show the violation of this or that human rights. This is also quite a funny, good, uh, relaxing, a kind of break from very serious, maybe, topic, just uh, to, to Mm, for people to understand that it's about our real life as well. They can be in situations like this <laughs> in real life, for example, when we are teenagers. Mm -hmm. And uh, this exercise, uh, the girl, it says Imam, it's uh, like Muslim biskop, and Kina means woman. So basically, we would, it's about the civil society actually, but basically we would uh, ask the kids close their eyes and give them some, some identity, like president, like businessman, like military man, police, um, homeless, I don't know, uh, disabled, pensioner, journalist, advocates, blah, blah. And then I would, we would try to make into, into the groups, so they come on, make, make up the groups. They would make up the groups and uh, try to discuss uh, why they were making groups like this. So that basic idea is to show that our society is consisting of the so-called economic power, uh, money, the so-called political power, people being elected, the so-called religious power, power. But what about all the rest? What about the homeless, pensioner, woman, disabled, single mother? Uh, yeah. What about these people? Like, and what kind of uh, power they can have in order to, to make life better and to make uh, human rights um, reality for more. Mm -hmm. Then I see also, and we see also that Kahoot uh, is being used quite a lot uh, uh, last years, and uh, not only in um, primary school, but also in high schools, quite a lot actually. And uh, I see that um, uh, teachers love it, they love to do it individually, but they will also put pupils into groups and uh, make a kind of this competition running uh, between groups into the class. And it's quite popular, I think, on different subjects. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, since I was talking so much about the real life, <laughs> about, uh, yeah, but we are, we are we are in a way in real life every day and school is a part of this. It's not a separate institute. Uh, I want to bring your attention back to our rea reality in Norway and uh, highlight maybe two focuses uh, which are very strong right now. Uh, and the first one uh, would be actually continuation of the questions I've got uh, about the so-called punishment of teachers. It's on uh, mental health. It's a concern. It's a concern from national authorities. It's also a concern from civil societies, uh, society institutions, and also a concern from uh, the school that um, uh, statistics would show that kids are being depressed and lonely and uh, feeling that not that good. And wh what shall we do with all this? Uh, I can even show you a, a couple of examples how we can. Um, how we are doing this in Norway mm -hmm. and democracy, but I will come back to this. Uh, before we go to mental health, I would, um, I would also mention another uh, huge focus uh, is um, it's actually related to the mental health, mental health in the way uh, what kind of 
sources of information you're using and what kind of media you're using. Uh, in Norway right now, we do are talking a lot about so-called critical thinking, which is going like red line um, everywhere in any subject or also in school life in general as such. So we want, uh, we want children to, to ask questions, to be curious and to, to find uh, different sources of information and to try to put it together and try to argumentate why exactly this source of information they would uh, consider as reliable. And this is pretty much the school education is also about whatever subject it comes to. Also history, for example. History is quite interesting example because now we would see that theories are going on, conspiratorial theories about Jewish people, for example, about the Holocaust. And for kids, uh, it's also, as it is very important and for a teacher it's quite, quite hard because uh, at the university you've been taught one thing, but kids in the class can come up with many different, uh, almost crazy ideas and you have to handle this. So critical thinking would be very important. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's okay, we can um, go further. We're still in the civil society impact on the school education. Um, can you go further, Elspieta? Mm -hmm. um, well, I spoke too much about the real society, but just the real, the real challenges. This is a picture of um, uh, protesting. Kids are protesting for ecological problems here in Norway in front of the parliament. This is the parliament. It used to happen every Friday, maybe in your country as well. Uh, not anymore because of Corona, but uh, the movement is there and um, the concern is there. And civil society organizations are also quite active when it comes to uh, ecological, environmental problems and uh, global climate change and oil destruction, for example, in a vision case, all this stuff. For example, we have an, uh, an NGO called uh, Ecological Agents. It's for small kids, basically, um, primary school. They would be very, very um, active, coming into school, suggesting their activities, everything from uh, you know, going around and uh, picking up garbage, but also about the personal choices you make as a kid like what kind of presents you expect, what kind of presents you got, how much plastic was there, what do you think is going on, happening to this plastic. So they're trying to suggest in some interactive way also um, to make kids reflect on the personal choice they do and their parents do in everyday life. Um, another NGO, Nature and um, <clears throat> Use, uh, it's for 25 years old. I mean, you cannot be 26 and be part of it. <laughs> it's only for young people. They're cute, they're very active, and uh, they managed to bring Norwegian state to court last year uh, because they think that uh, Norwegian authorities are too, they're breaching uh, the paragraph number two in constitution and not thinking about the future generations and welfare of future generations when they decide for oil destructing in uh, natural uh, reservoirs, in natural parks up north Norway. So it's quite a big, um, a very, very uh, active into school. Uh, another uh, example I would um, recommend to find out more if you'd like to know about Norway is uh, Operation Dagsverk. It's basically an operation, the day of operation. It's a project run by the school student of Norway, which I cited before. It's also about real life, but not only Norway real life. Uh, you have, they bring our focus, focus of kid outside. So they, every year they would choose a topic. Uh, it's about young people, it's about pupils in different countries and try to make up a relation between uh, pupils in Norway and what's going on in this or that country. Like for example, last year it was about the refugee kids 
coming from uh, neighboring countries to Uganda and being deprived of education, what kind of situation they they are. Uh, uh, and the year before it was uh, about kids in Congo. Um, working in mines, distracting, for example, uh, elements and resources being used in our mobile phones. So this is also the way civil society institutions bring up um, challenges from abroad to our reality. I mean, we are using electric, electronic cars, we are using mobiles, consisting cobalt and other chemical uh, resources. And yeah, so kids go and find out what kind of situations their pupils uh, are there in this country. Are they going to school or are they working? And if they work, how much they work, why they're working, all this stuff. So it's quite a huge topic and I know it's popular among pupils and it populates among teachers uh, to have this focus, not only in our narrow context, but um, outside as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, back to critical thinking, uh, I'm pretty much sure it's very uh, relevant for your um, context as well, social media and everything we, what's going on, and how you, how we as civil society uh, institutions of different uh, kinds can help in a way, or bring in methods to teachers into schools in order to make uh, kids again reflect what kind of uh, preferences they make, what kind of choices they make. In this sense, I will um, use the, uh, the reference to an exercise inviting kids to reflect on the applications they have on their mobiles. So it's like for 13, 12 years old. And you know, we know that kids from 10 years old, most of them have mobiles and most of them would have um, TikTok uh, and maybe Snapchat, even though the age limit is 13 years old, but they are there. So you don't, you, we cannot just also close our eyes and pretend that they, we don't know that they are there. So you have to talk to them and uh, try to um, ask from different angles, like um, what was the last you posted? Uh, did you react on something? Do you think? Do you see any advertisement when you're using this application? If you if you if you think it's an advertisement, how do you understand this? Would you recommend this to your friends? Why not? Is there anything you react? Is there any impact uh, focus on the body or appearance stuff like this? And uh, I see that a lot of more and more civil society institutions are very active in this sphere um, when it comes to digital mobbing, how we call it digital bullying, digital bullying between kids, because it does make an impact on uh, school environment and communication between kids. And uh, as a result, uh, in, into a safe school environment. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, this is also a uh, method or approach we use as a Human Rights Academy quite a lot. It uh, also brings um, democratic challenges and human rights challenges, not from the world everywhere, like sustainable goals and United Nations and all this stuff, but from your local community. So we would invite schools and pupils to be through uh, workshops on human rights in order to understand what human rights are about and why do we have them, how they work and how they don't work. And then they will uh, make um, a work on their own, producing uh, photo projects and reflecting on the topics and problems they think they're crucial and important to the place they live. So it's also a kind of um, bring reality and um, naming challenges and reality. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, can you? And well, this is um, back to my last point actually uh, mental health. Uh, I put it last because it's a huge uh, topic right now, as I uh, mentioned before. And uh, here 
I use um, actually, how do you call this in English? I would I use these uh, products from school to my son because I see that teachers are trying to make people to invite pupils uh, to give not the compliments but to describe each other, but not in a verbal way. I mean, it's when we are sitting in the class. Uh, I can't say, Elzbieta, you are cool, but I also can be too shy to say that, Elzbieta, you are cool. But sometimes it's easier for them to write, especially if uh, nobody is uh, seeing what they're writing. So this, this is um, a tool teachers are using quite a lot, as I see it in primary school especially, to make kids put nice words. I mean, to, 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 to give something good to each other to put like uh, you are um, you're cute, you are cool, you are funny, you are active, you draw good, you are like cuckoo, you are creative, you are too quick, uh, and you are you know, something good, good friend. So it's most, most of these uh, things would be positive. And that's like the whole idea. Um, even though they mean it, don't mean it, but they would do it. And the teacher themselves, teacher, teachers also would write to small kids uh, good things, especially at the start of uh, every year and at the end of every year. Like, um, I'm so happy that, ex especially you, my pupil, I'm happy about it. This is quite common to hear. Uh, what we also see is a civil society institution called um, World Day for Mental Health is being more and more active, trying to come into school because um, we do, because of statistics, right? Because our kids stay that they're depressed as, as more they grow up, uh, as more they are depressed in a way. Uh, so they go to school, but uh, on social media, they would, they would be quite, uh, they can, yeah, happen to be in different fora, in different um, environments. So uh, the World Day for Mental Health did run a couple of campaigns, which uh, I think was quite interesting in a region context to make uh, pupils of different age, not just to be nice to each other, but uh, to be curious about each other, not just to go into this uh, uh, earphones and uh, listen to your music, but uh, actually take a pause, take a break, stop up and uh, speak to each other. Because what we also see, we do not do this that much anymore. And our kids, they would not do this that much anymore. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. Well, yes, and uh, the last maybe in my example I would use for you um, in order to get to know a bit of the context and if you want to read it more is uh, the so-called grown-ups for children. It's also, it's also a, a kind of encouragement for grown-ups, for parents and for teachers to come together and uh, not identify themselves as um, existing on different planets in a way, if you understand what I mean. I mean, we are in the same boat. Parents and teachers, we are in the same boat when we are talking about kid, about um, people, uh, kids' achievement, about his or her social life, about his character, about his preferences, about his dreams. So it's about uh, more or less dialogues between these different stakeholders. Uh, because uh, in the very long run, uh, a pupil, a kid, would feel that something is not functioning in a way. So it's better to come up together. <clears throat> and I see that it also works in a way, because schools are quite open, teachers are quite open, and parents also. It's not only uh, artificial attitude to school. We do understand that school is a part of our life and we have to feel safe uh, that the place we are sending our kids to is safe for our kids. So 
parents are also trying to contribute and to be active and uh, actually care what's going on inside. <clears throat> okay, uh, we can skip this because uh, it's a video, you can uh, have a look after. Well, and to, to wind up, um, I again would uh, bring you back to the principle of non-discrimination. Unfortunately, I don't know, I don't, we don't have that much time to talk about the all, um, all possibilities to include different uh, kinds of kids, but at least, at least when it comes to children with um, minority cultural background, we know that it's a lot of focus here in Norway. We know that in schools you can have um, the so-called inter intercultural advisor. And we know that it's being used, this position is being used by high school children uh, coming with, with, from different minority uh, families uh, to ask for help and to assistance when, for example, they experience some social pressure at home when, for example, they, they would experience their parents demanding this and that, uh, using this clothes and not this, um, getting married to this guy or to this girl, or at least pushing to get to have this education, to choose this line in high school, things like this when it comes to psychological pressure. Uh, the rights of a child, the rights of a young man or a young woman would way more than, for example, the rights of a parent to advise on their <clears throat> choices in life. So minority advices is quite a big topic uh, and crucial, actually. And we also see that the Nordic cooperation between uh, Nordic countries and Iceland, uh, Finland and uh, Denmark, Sweden is quite active in the recent years exactly on this topic. And of course, uh, kids with special needs. Uh, it's a very huge topic. It's about uh, inclusion of these kids, but it would not, it would never mean that kids, for example, with uh, different variations of autism would be put into the so-called ordinary class. It's not, it would not be inclusion. Uh, inclusion is about you have, you're taking starting point in what each kid needs. Each, every child needs, whether he or she feels comfortable, then a school administration would uh, consider uh, to be part of an ordinary class. Otherwise, uh, they, will be on, they would be on their own and they would be um, provided uh, personal assistant when they go to school. The same, would, uh, the same I would say, for dyslexia. dyslexia I don't know whether it's uh, mm, uh, an issue in Poland, but uh, no, it's an issue. It would mean that, yeah, uh, persons, they are stocking letters and not that <clears throat> quick when they are reading. Uh, now, in 2021, we do have a lot of tools how to approach these kids and provide, for example, alternative uh, tools when they are taking exams providing computers or yeah, personal assistance also, and uh, longer time for an exam, shorter time for an exam. All this is quite an individual approach, I would say. But it's, it's a huge topic on its own uh, to describe in details how it's going on here exactly. Well, uh, I'm not sure about the time, but that was pretty much it um, in order to give you a kind of a short um, picture what's going on here and how we as a civil society institution trying to be part of school education in Norway. And uh, yeah, so my basic idea was that civil society is very active uh, because um, we do feel that we are part of this society and we have something to say. And uh, through our work, we can contribute, for example, with methods, you know, in our case, with methods in, uh, for teachers in the classroom. But I'm pretty much sure there are organizations as well when it comes to environmental issues or to psychological help, mental issues, or um, 
safety of children, like physical and psychological safety. Hmm. So that's Thank it. Thank you, Yevgenia. Are you on the translation? Then I will speak for yes, Polish. Okay. Bardzo, bardzo Ci, Eugenia, dziękujemy um, za ten wykład. No właśnie, za ten przegląd e, i praktyk e, szkolnych, jak i tych praktyk e, organizacji społecznych. E, no i e, wykorzystajmy jeszcze te kilka minut, które nam zostało na pytania od Państwa. E, może któreś z tych praktyk jakoś Państwa bardziej zainteresowało, albo chcieliby się Państwo odnieść właśnie jeszcze raz do tego, na ile to się wiąże z tymi prawami człowieka czy prawami dziecka, od których wyszliśmy, czy z edukacją włączającą. Zapraszamy właśnie do, do zadawania pytań. Można skorzystać teraz z czatu. Można skorzystać. Te na czacie tutaj są takie też organizacyjne. Dzięki podziękowania dla Ciebie, Jewgenia, za informację, czego możemy zazdrościć Norwegii. <laughs> Jaki też pojawił się komentarz od Pani Katarzyny. U nas te problemy rozwiązuje wychowawca klasy. I Pani Katarzyno, czy może mogłaby Pani trochę doprecyzować, w którym to było momencie, przyznaję, że mi umknął moment, w którym ten komentarz się pojawił, o które problemy chodzi i właśnie, czy tutaj jakby coś z tych praktyk Pani też odnajduje w tych swoich praktykach jako wychowawcy, wychowawczyni klasy może? O, pojawia się jeszcze coś? Aha, nie, nie, tutaj już to są te pytania Pani Maryny, na które odpowiadaliśmy, to mnie zainteresowała ta kwestia tego dobrego samopoczucia, bo jest to jakoś tam zapisane, tak, że, że uczeń, uczennica mają prawo czuć się w szkole dobrze i jednocześnie jest to jakoś tam indywidualne, no i na ile jakby rzeczywiście to jest sprawdzalne z uczniami, uczennicami, jak to wygląda w praktyce? Mieliśmy ten przykład, że na przykład, że ta przestrzeń szkoły się zmienia, ale w takim życiu klasy, życiu właśnie wychowawcy, wychowawczyni. Well, yes, we mean that we have the law open up for the kids are supposed to feel good for the at school so it's not enough to be physically in school to be present to sit and uh, to participate to listen they have to have psychological comfort but uh, of course it's very individual I absolutely agree and uh, it's uh, that's the whole problem i mean sometimes kids would not tell you even that they are not uh, that comfortable being at school And the class teacher would not see it uh, as well. Sometimes it, it does can take time for pupils to speak up. That's why we, uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, researchers uh, would show that uh, psychological health, mental health is not, is being worse and worse, is getting worse and worse. That's why we do have this discussion going on and um, Uh, it has become popular in schools to create a kind of not conflict resolution in its classical sense, but a kind of mentoring. When you have some kids uh, trying uh, to make up uh, activities, engaging different from different backgrounds, and maybe then uh, those who are not that com comfortable in school would say, would open up and uh, say it's not about uh, crime and punishment even it's, it's more 
it's more about the right, uh, you have the right to be safe also when it comes to your psychology, but your psychological portrait is, of course, uh, very unique and different from other kids. A i tutaj um, pojawiło się to doprecyzowanie od pani Katarzyny, e, taka e, od mm -hmm. praktyka polskich szkół, że kiedy zgłaszane były problemy od rodziców, to zajmuje się nimi dyrektor, ale takimi problemami mniejszego kalibru rozwiązuje właśnie wychowawca, wychowawczyni klasy. Mm -hmm. Dziękujemy za to, za tę perspektywę. Mm. Uh, well, yes, I don't know. It, 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 we have to see on the different levels. I mean, primary school is one thing with the class teacher. Or um, yeah, secondary high school. High school doesn't have any class teacher. So they are kind of grown ups there and, uh, and things are more seriously, serious there as well. When it comes to primary school, class teacher has a huge role to play, uh, really. Uh, it's a kind of, not a parent exactly, it's like a bonus parent maybe sometimes, right? Uh, maybe the same situation in Poland. But also, we also see that uh, they're using some tools to bring different kids together. Like for example, you can have kids from different families, from different language backgrounds. <laughs> and maybe parents would not be that fluent in Norwegian language. Then teacher, would put deliberately uh, these kids together, different kids, make up a group, a group. So they would call it friendship groups. It's not for, it's not forever. It's maybe for a semester, maybe for two months. And the idea is um, teachers keeping, keeping um, observing kids in a way and seeing who is playing with whom and who is not playing with whom. So the kids we are not playing with will be in your friendship room, uh, group. Mm -hmm. And the idea is then to, for parents, teacher would contact parents and say, hey, look, now you have this and that friendship groups, five kids. I see they're not playing that much. Uh, you don't have to pay a lot of money. You don't have to bring to the cinema, I don't know, physical exercises, but it's enough just to meet together, play outside just after school time, being together with exactly these five uh, persons. There is a belief that it works in a way that kids don't um, are not only playing uh, with the, those they like to play, but they're pushing, you're pushing the boundaries of kids to open up for others who probably cannot speak like you or who probably doesn't look like you and does not have the same clothes like you, but um, it's still possible to play anyway, mm -hmm. together. That's a I kind of two rozumiem, um, rozumiem, że tutaj też po, e, oprócz szkoły w ten proces e, właśnie są angażowani rodzice, którzy te informacje dostają i yes, też yes, mogą yes. jakoś dodać. Mm -hmm. Pojawiło się kilka yes. pytań na czacie, yeah. e, więc je odczytam. Jaki... There is also, uh, before you take another question, I know that it has become quite popular uh, measure uh, from parents to discuss in schools when it comes to birthday parties, for example, because kids would go to birthdays, especially when you are a small kid, and uh, parents are trying to um, drop presents, for example. Uh, so um, parents would not send your kid with a present mm -hmm. because so then the idea is. Um, for very small kids, it's enough to come together and play together and dance together and eat a cake, not bothering about kind, what kind of present and who is coming with what and what, how expensive it is and all this stuff. I, I see that it's more and more um, routine here. It's very usual mm -hmm. to drop. There's a lot of practice in the direction to tak, wrócę do, do pytań. Pierwsze, które się tutaj pojawiło od pani Anny Baron. W jaki sposób mm. sporządzane u Państwa są procedury reagowania w przypadku wystąpienia przemocy rówieśniczej? Mm. Bullying, is, uh, bullying is, uh, is a problem. It's very strict. Um, 
we do have a, a separate law on prohibition of bullying. Uh, it doesn't mean that kids will not bully each other because they would do. <laughs> but it's about, uh, again, school administration has to react. As I uh, mentioned before, you cannot pretend uh, being a school administration that uh, if you know about the case, if you, if you got uh, any message from parents or from neighbors or from, ki from kids uh, themselves, you cannot, um, do, you cannot do nothing in a way. You have to react. Mm -hmm. um, to so, um... and, also, and also, uh, earlier, before it was very usual that uh, young people, young pupils who would bully, they would stay in schools and the so-called victims would change schools. And now it's been changed. Now it's uh, vice versa. So uh, the efforts are being made uh, on pupils who are actually bullying, that uh, they kind of can be placed in another place. But it's also huge work with um, parents. And um, I know that conflict resolution, civil society organizations are very active to come up on preventive level. It's about communication between kids. It's about uh, human rights, it's about human dignity. It's about respect, not only in the words, not only in theory, but uh, through um, activities, um, yeah, through practical activities. But mm -hmm. it's a huge topic, yes. Pojawiło się też pytanie o różnorodność narodowościową w norweskich szkołach i jak wygląda ta pomoc uczniom, migrantom, obcokrajowcom. Well, yes, it's uh, as I said, it's a diverse society. It's uh, we call it multicultural society here in Norway. We have a uh, hundred uh, um, different nationalities presented here in our society. So we do have kids from different backgrounds. Uh, you know, the word ethnicity uh, is uh, disappearing from uh, stage in a way. It's um, ethnical identity, ethnicity, ethnical back background is not being used that much anymore because um, research shows that at the time being, uh, we can even choose our identity, how we define ourselves. Uh, of course, there, there can be discussion, especially um, in front of elections, political elections, if there are any Norwegian culture, Norwegian inheritance, Norwegian ethnicity, but uh, as time is going, it's uh, disappearing actually from uh, the language. Uh, and we do have a lot of mixed families. So how, what about these kids? Uh, how they uh, can be defined? Why, why should we define them as ethnic this or ethnic that? They can decide them, themselves what kind of uh, background they have and what their identity is about. It's more, it's more in this way. But of course, when it comes about to refugees, to a refugee family can, uh, coming to Norway, the kids would go to school because uh, every kid living in Norway has the right to attend the school. And primary school is uh, free of charge to everybody. If you don't know the language, the kids would place in the so-called preparational class for a year, just to, to, to have some language, and then they will attend uh, the ordinary school's lessons, yes. Thank you. Może jeżeli e, Pani potrzebują też jeszcze doprecyzowania mm -hmm. e, tych e, odpowiedzi, to e, proszę też jeszcze dopisać na czacie, czy, e, czy ta odpowiedź jest jakoś satysfakcjonująca, czy może jeszcze jest potrzeba o coś dopytać. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There is a lot of text in the chat, but I have no chance to understand uh, what it is about. Jest też powtórzone to pytanie o przemoc rówieśniczą um, i jeszcze takie do pytanie, e, co twoim zdaniem e, należałoby zrobić e, w przypadku przemocy czy e, wykluczenia w klasie, 
I jak ja byłaś ty, jako też specjalistka od edukacji na temat praw człowieka i edukacji włączającej w Norwegii, zaleciła, jeżeli coś takiego się w klasie wydarza. Well, um, it would depend, of course, on the age, but uh, we in Human Rights Academy, we do have some experience, uh, quite a lot of experience working with them, um, not with very small kids, but from 14 years old. Uh, in this sense, yes, we, we do hear that they bully each other on uh, social media. Even at our workshops, like uh, you, you can have uh, people sitting on their own and chatting and writing something, and suddenly uh, we hear that, oh, okay, he has posted a comment to a girl, for example, sitting nearby. Well, yes, what we are doing about this, uh, what we are doing, uh, what we can do uh, is to have some exercises when it comes to identity. We do have some practical exercise uh about identity about personal identity about uh, your well you if you are very much interested we can have a contact and i can send you description step by step and you can try in your classroom it's basically you ask the kids and uh, the pupils in the classroom give them a sentence to begin with um everybody everybody who liked dance go this way some would go, some would stay, come back. Everybody who, have, who can speak uh, three languages, come this place. Every, some would go, some would stay. Everybody who has green eyes, go there. Everybody who is left-handed is there. And then you have this motion in the class. The next step would be to draw a human being on the blackboard, if you want, with a chalk. So traditional as it is and try to discuss with them, reflect what, what has happened in the room. Why did I do this with you? Why did I give these your sentences? What I wanted. They would say, yeah, to show that we are different in some ways, but to show that we are alike. And that would be the right answer, right? Because some would be left-handed, but not everybody. So you would put a body and um, uh, identity as a keyword, and reflect on some biological bi background, like for example, some characteristics you cannot change. I cannot, I cannot change my, the color of my eyes and most probably sex. Well, I can try to use my, to change my sex, but it's uh, uh, yeah, more time consuming proce procedure. I cannot t change my abilities, right? If I cannot go, if I um, have some disabilities, I cannot do something about it. But some things I do can change. <laughs> and then you reflect on your environment and school and family and traditional religion and culture and all this stuff. And the very end, you um, try to bring discussion, but what about free will that everybody of us has being a person? You can actually choose what to be, what to point to. I can choose uh, what, what I see in a person when I first meet him or her. Do I see, like for example, that he's a gay, first of all? Or do I see that he's a Muslim? Or do, or do we see that we are complex individuals? So this is, this is the starting point to talk about identity. And then we used to follow up with an exercise, it's group uh, work exercise, where uh, I would put different colors they would close their eyes, I would put different colors on their forehead. And when people open up their eyes, they are supposed to make groups. And most typically, of course, they would produce groups because of color, right? So you have in the classroom green group, red group, yellow group, and then you have one person having only black color or white color, staying on, on its own. And then you see this dynamic. In some classes, they would uh, drag this person into my group where we are many. In some then classrooms, they would say, hey, you are not like us. You are diff you're a different color. We are greens, you are black, you stay on your own. And then you also have this uh, discussion and give a lecture about the group grouping in our society. 
that it's why we are going into groups, um, why it's natural for us to make up groups, but what kind of um, uh, danger it can also have. And then you bring up some historical, at the very end, you bring up some historical event, for example, as uh, the Second World War and the uh, Holocaust or Rwanda or Bosnia. In, um, yeah. So um, this is in a way, at least our tools, how to deal, how to approach the so-called uh, issue of bullying. Because to go straight to the bullying as a topic, um, well, maybe in conflict resolution experts, it, it can work. But when it comes to human rights, you have to go through the whole prehistory, how we are existing in our society, on our individual level, in groups level, what has happened in history before, why has happened, for example, during the Second World War, and what has had become the result of uh, all these historical events. And then maybe uh, young people, they would think more like, well, yes, they're different and I don't like her, but still I'm not supposed to, to be rude or to be nasty. I mean, it's not cool anymore. I mean, at the, at the very end, as a teacher, we try to, we try to make not it cool. We, try to, we have to try to make it it's cool to be okay. It's cool to be um, friendly to each other. It has to be fashionable in a way. Dziękujemy bardzo Jewgenia i też dziękujemy Państwu, że zostali Państwo z nami jeszcze ten 15 minut już dłużej. Tak jak pojawiło się na czacie, po więcej przykładów takich okay. ćwiczeń zapraszamy, zapraszamy, żeby odszukać książkę Buduj mosty, nie mury, którą stworzyła właśnie Human Rights Academy. Um, a tymczasem już e, będziemy mm. kończyć to That's ostatnie true. webinarium e, z programu Wychowanie to Podstawa. E, dziękujemy, Jewgenia, za, za Twój wykład i te wszystkie przykłady. Mam nadzieję, że coś e, dla Państwa było tutaj inspirujące. Whatever thoughts and ideas, and uh, if you want to share our experiences, your experiences in classroom, uh, absolutely, it would be very interesting. And um, yeah, feel free. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you.